All right, I am pleased to introduce Bruce Teeple. Bruce is a writer, speaker, and local historian. He currently serves as president of the Union County Historical Society, as a judge, and on the state advisory board of the National History Day uh, competition in Pennsylvania, as volunteer coordinator of the Penn State Native American Powwow, and as an instructor for Penn State's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute also known as Ollie. He has also served as chair of the American Association for State and Local Histories Small Museum Scholarship Committee for 16 years. And he has spoken on various topics before numerous groups and conferences. Bruce, thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you, Robin. Thank you all for signing on for this. I'd like to begin by asking you all a question. What words, images, and thoughts go through your mind when you hear the word Amish? Horses, buggies, furniture. I'd like to begin by sharing a few random, seemingly disconnected anecdotes that may dispel any preconceived notions that you have. My wife and I first became aware of the local Amish presence the first day we moved to the uh, <clears throat> suburbs of Woodward 45 years ago. Here we were, two kids from Philadelphia, young and dumb newlyweds, our heads filled with dreams of going back to the land. Talk about culture shock. As we're driving down the, the back road to the place where we would live for the next nine years, we noticed a group of women in bright blue dresses milling around a ramshackle farmhouse. Oh my, my wife exclaimed, what are these nuns doing out here in the middle of nowhere? They must have done something bad. Uh, I think they're Amish, I replied. And so began the first of many interactions with these people. A few days later, we took a walk down the road to that farmhouse. The woman who lived there came out onto her porch, her long hair disheveled and flowing, which I found out later is frowned upon and extremely rare. Hi, neighbor, she said, would you like some coffee? My wife and I immediately had visions of coffee beans slowly passing through an antique grinder, crafted and hand-turned by a real live Amish woman. <clears throat> so we accepted the offer and went inside. Once we sat down, she opened her cupboard. Which kind do you like, Folgers or Taster's Choice? To add to our shock, nay, <laughs> our absolute devastation, it was instant coffee. <sighs> That's as much of, of an abomination, uh, an affront to nature as light beer or blended whiskey or decaffeinated coffee. We went over to another Amish farmhouse several months later. Now, whenever we visited that place, all 16 of the children would line up from the youngest to the oldest in a straight line and stare at us without saying a word. The first time that happened, it was a bit unnerving, but we got used to it with each visit. We then went inside where the mother was dressing fresh, freshly butchered chickens. She looked over her shoulder with a blank look at us and said in a flat monotone, I think these chickens are moonstruck. The hairs stood up on the back of my neck until I thought about it later on. And then I realized what she was saying. There's an old folk belief that the light of the full moon makes people crazy, hence the term lunatic. In her mind, the full moon made her chickens nervous and their skin tightened up so much that she had a hard time plucking the tiny pin feathers. Another time, an Amish neighbor asked my wife if she could hitch a ride to town. Sure, my wife answered, Maybe this afternoon, though, I have an appointment this morning with the dentist. The woman was shocked. The dentist? How old are you? She blurted out. My wife was 33 at the time. The, the woman couldn't believe it. 33. 
and you still have your own teeth. That wasn't hard to believe given the time-honored Deitch cuisine of Greece and sweets. When our eldest daughter was in high school, she worked at the village's general store. <clears throat> Every Friday and Saturday night, young Amish fellas would come in to buy cigarettes and rolls of caps. That's right, caps to hit with rocks and hammers to simulate the sounds of gunfire, the way we did as kids years ago. And their conversation focused on the usual topics all young men talk about. What are they saying, Dad? My daughter asked. Uh, no sense repeating that. When they come around again, though, just go, what's that mean? You are a female contemporary telling male adolescents, watch out, boy. I guarantee that that testosterone dripping off their shirt sleeves will quickly dry up. Up to the counter they came, talking tough, Amish homies, and she let them have it. Then they turned to me with an embarrassed Akshaisa look on their faces. I couldn't resist laughing. Yeah, boys, and I know your daddy's too. It's time to go home. They spoke English at the counter after that and minded their manners a little more. One last story. Years ago, we stopped in Swingle. It's a little village off the main drag in Union County. And in the center of town was an old church that had been converted into a library slash bookstore. A guy who was even taller than me and who was about as cadaverous as uh, Boris Karloff opened the door. In the basement were all these high quality, scholarly and therefore pricey books for sale from university presses. Upstairs, there were about a half dozen fellows dressed like stereotypical grad students, you know, wire rim glasses, corduroy jackets with elbow patches. And they're all sitting around these tables. The entire place was packed with shelf after shelf of books and tracks. But these were not popular works of contemporary fiction. Every shelf had prints of men standing over female torture victims. And every one of those volumes, thousands of volumes, had the same theme. The Roman Catholic Church's plan to rule the world. What really goes on in convents and so on. It was as if the, the Reformation was still alive and kicking, but in Swengel? And how was all this connected? To avoid any confusion about the terminology I use, let's first clear up any possible misunderstanding about geography and linguistics. The Federal Republic of Germany, as we know it today, did not exist until the late 19th century, as when Otto von Bismarck united dozens of little duchies and principalities. For centuries, anyone professing a belief different from the local ruler had to leave. This led to numerous waves of migration. About 15% of them would eventually arrive on these shores. But the overwhelming majority of these refugees moved to the traditional Eastern lands in Prussia, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. Germans don't call themselves German. They call themselves Deutsche. Early immigration officials here in turn confused the word Deutsche with Dutch, as in Holland Dutch. Many of those German immigrants spoke a regional dialect, technically called Feltzisch, because it's still spoken today by over 2 million people in the state of modern Germany called Rhineland Pfalz, or what we call the Palatinate. But this dialect is generally called Deutsch, or Pennsylvania Dutch, here in this country. Ethnic Germans belong to, to many different religious groups. Followers of Martin Luther were Lutherans. Followers of John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli belong to the Reformed Church, now called the United Church of Christ. Many communities 
throughout Pennsylvania's German belt formed union churches where Lutheran and Reformed congregations shared a common church building and worshiped on alternating Sundays. More pacifist groups split off even further and were collectively called Anabaptists. These Anabaptists have divided and evolved into numerous sects, including the Hutterites, the Schwenksfelders, the Mennonites, and the Amish. And we'll talk more about these Anabaptists in a few moments. In central Pennsylvania, we have two major sects of Amish. First are the Lancaster Amish, or what we call here locally, Black Tops. They've been coming here from Lancaster County, especially since being imprisoned as conscientious objectors during the Second World War. Their places tend to be tidy, with mass plantings of flowers around their yards. They also have businesses such as carpentry shops and harness and shoe shops and greenhouses. Their names are usually King, Stoltzfus, Beiler, and Fisher. Then there's the Nebraska Amish, or White Tops, who tend to be more conservative and whose homes have not always been quite as picture perfect. I've heard three or four reasons why they're called the Nebraska Amish, the most likely being that a bishop from Nebraska at one time settled a dispute. The Nebraska Amish have been in central Pennsylvania since the 1790s, first settling in Mifflin County, then branching out to Penns Valley and Union County. The older ones tend to grow their flowers behind the outhouse. To do otherwise demonstrates excessive pride. Some also smoke pipes and hand rolled cigarettes, whereas the Lancaster Amish around here generally do not. Most of the Nebraska Amish are either farmers, they run sawmills, or they work in construction. One even has a seasonal, seasonal raw cider press. Their names tend to be Yoder, Hostetler, and Hirschberger. A Nebraska Amish friend of mine asked me a few years ago why his people believe what they do. He had no idea why he had to drive in a horse and buggy or grow a beard or wear the clothes that he wore. So how did he and how did we get to this state of affairs? Let's begin with Gutenberg's invention of a printing press with movable type. We can't dismiss the impact this invention had on Western Europe's subsequent history. Nothing up until then had promoted hit literacy as much as the printing press. Not only could God's word be mass produced, it could be disseminated. People could translate it into the vernacular, into the language of the people. So you could actually read the word of God herself. You didn't have to rely on someone else's interpretation of the Bible. Think of the personal liberation, of the political ramifications, and of the anxieties and repercussions this created among Western Europe's rulers. Anyone able to read could find some reason some rationale for holding different religious and political beliefs. You no longer needed sacraments or the actions of a middleman to save your soul. You could achieve that direct connection through God's grace. People can now find biblical references to justify their revolts against the abuses perpetrated by princes, priests, and even the Pope. They could now question established authority, and they fervently believed that God had their backs. Many of these reformers believed that religious truth was not necessarily allegorical, with lots of pleasant parables to comfort us in times of distress. One could now read and take God's word and Christ's cheap teachings literally and practice them as such. We, as like-minded individuals, can imitate the life of Christ as we interpret it. 
While we can trace many of these early Protestant leanings to the 1500s, they actually go back 100 years earlier. Historians usually group these reformist beliefs under the general heading of Anabaptism. An Anabaptist in German is a Vita Teufel, literally, again, baptized. Because Anabaptists could not find any mention of infant baptism in the Bible, they believed that individuals could only join the communion of souls when they're old enough to understand their actions. Baptism to them must be a conscious decision by adults, not just a sacramental right automatically carried out on babies. Anabaptists condemned all forms of what they saw as government coercion, whether it was compulsory military service, taking a human life, or swearing allegiance to rulers and countries. Some Anabaptist groups adopted strict dress codes and modes of behavior to set themselves apart and identify each other. To do otherwise would make one worldly, that is to place the world of man over and above a world ruled by God. They also held services in each other's homes rather than in church buildings. Some Anabaptist groups claimed they could raise the dead. Others took on a more charismatic tone by practicing faith healing, speaking in tongues, and dancing wildly. Or they practiced forms of Christian communism by following the Sermon on the Mount and rejecting the notion of private property. Some even practice polygamy. One leader in Moravia, by the name of Balthasar Hübmeyer, asserted that his followers were, quote, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, and clothing the naked. For in truth, we are not masters of our possessions, but st only stewards. None of this clarification mattered to clerics and rulers, not when they had to put down over 300,000 peasants who were rampaging across the French, German, and Swiss countrysides in 1525. This peasants' war merely confirmed the establishment's worst fears of total anarchy brought on by this new form of religious thinking. Unfortunately, as too often occurs in human history, those who revolt against their oppressors often become self-righteous oppressors themselves. It was only 10 years later when some Anabaptist fanatics established an authoritarian regime in the city of Münster. It lasted 18 months. A bigger issue, though, separated the Anabaptists from the Protestant leaders such as Zwingli and Luther, and that was in practicing religious toleration by advocating the separation of church and state. Protestant and Catholic leaders alike could not tolerate all these religious and political heresies held by the Anabaptists. Many governments ordered that all Anabaptists be, quote, killed like wild beasts without judge or trial, including Balthasar Hübmeyer, who was burned at the stake. Thousands of others met a similar fate or were drowned, thrown into prison, starved to death, tortured, and beheaded. Few locations and people in human history suffered as much widespread misery and privation as did Germany during the 1600s. Beginning in 1618 and continuing for another 30 years, waves of mercenaries from Denmark, Sweden, Spain, and France raided the homes, barns, and storehouses of German farmers. In addition, the invaders wintered over their homes, ravaged their women, kidnapped their children for ransom, and burned their churches. Thousands of acres of fertile farmland were abandoned for lack of manpower, animals, or seed. Crops were used to feed the armies. Anything remaining was burned to prevent feeding the enemy. Peasants who had not fled east to safety were left to eat dogs, 
cats, rats, acorns, and grass. In Alsace, starving masses tore hanged criminals down from the gallows and ate them. In the Rhineland, exhumed bodies were sold for food. Roads were clogged with bandits, deserters, and fugitives. Typhus, typhoid, dysentery, and scurvy epidemics raced from town to town. Within four months, the plague claimed 10,000 people just in Munich alone. By the time the Treaty of Westphalia was signed in 1648, the population of Germany was cut almost in half. Bohemia lost over 75% of its original population. More than 80% of its villages became deserted. But political invasions by the French in 1674 and 1688 left the Western borderlands in complete ruin. Around this time, William Penn and his agents flooded the area with pamphlets to promote settlement of cheap land in the newly created province of Pennsylvania, a promise that sounded too good to be true to these persecuted Anabaptists. All of this persecution became a learning process for the surviving Anabaptists. They learned to tone down some of the religious and political radicalism. These new offshoots still rejected any use of violence against other people. Their faith focused on loving one's enemy. They still avoided all political participation, and those who strayed from the order were to be shunned unless they repented. One of these groups was the Mennonites, named after its founder, Menno Simons. Simons had been a Catholic priest for about 10 years when about 1636, he became disillusioned with what he saw as the churches drift away from the gospel's central message of turning one's cheek. Simons eventually joined the Anabaptist movement and was able to unite the various factions in Holland. In 1632, Simon's followers drew up a document known as the Dordrecht Confession, listing 18 core tenets of their belief. Out of these decades of persecution came the publication in Holland of a book, The Bloody Theater or Martyr's Mirror of the Defenseless Christians Who Baptized Only Upon Confession of Faith and Who Suffered and Died for the Testimony of Jesus Their Savior from the Time of Christ to the year A.D. 1660. This book, The Martyr's Mirror, is even longer than the title, with 1,500 pages documenting and illustrating the stories of every Christian martyr throughout Europe who died because of their beliefs. 1,600 years of them. No book, except for the Bible and their hymnal, known as the Ausbund, has a stronger influence on Mennonite and Amish beliefs. No publication reinforces the feeling of being unique, of being separate, and of being persecuted more than the martyr's mirror. Every child who reads it comes away with an appreciation of their ancestors' sacrifices. As part of the tradition of moderation, the Mennonites gradually stopped washing feet and practicing maidam, or shunning. That is, of refusing to eat or sleep with those who strayed from the faith. Christ, the Mennonites reasoned, kept company with sinners and remained holy, so they could too. In 1693, a Mennonite bishop named Jakob Amen created a rift when he argued that the church was ignoring Menno Simon's discipline. According to Amen, the best way to maintain a church discipline, according to Amen, was to reinstitute complete shunning of those sinners who refused to repent. Amen's followers, who called themselves Amish, also began washing feet again as part of a twice yearly rather than just an annual communion. Local bishops determined codes of dress and permissible forms of technology. The group 
moved first to Switzerland, then to Holland, before eventually settling in this country around 1720. The two largest groups are in Holmes County, Ohio, and Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Others, however, have spread across the Midwest and even into Canada and Latin America. One estimate has placed their numbers at about 250,000. They have a newspaper called The Budget. <laughs> you won't find any of the news as we know it in those pages. No talking heads, no commentary on what's going on in Washington or Harrisburg or even in Hollywood. No, this newspaper merely gives updates, updates on who is now where, who had died, who's having a sale, things of that sort. So what do these people believe and practice and why? To understand the Amish, you must first recognize their primary emphasis is on the welfare of their immediate community. Everything hinges on that. God manifested through the congregation will see you through tough times better than the worldly and coercive institutions of government. If you stray from the wolves, known as the Udnung, you risk causing the entire community to collapse. Congregations review these rules every two years and revise them if they find it necessary. Your personal salvation comes through emulating Christ as much as possible in your everyday work. They preach nonviolence, yet they do not hesitate in physically punishing their animals because humans are exercising their dominion over the animal world. Having electricity literally puts you in yoke with the unbelievers, although some Amish keep little telephone booths outside their homes at the edge of their property. Many even carry cell phones. It's more a matter of setting priorities concerning the use of technology. That is not allowing these things to invade and ruin the sanctity of home life. For example, how many of you get unsolicited, unsolicited phone calls at dinner time, especially during election seasons, or all the other nuisance calls we now get? I rest my case. Each Amish congregation operates independently with votes determining which men will hold the three offices. We have the Fölinger Dinger, Dina, this is the full servant, also in English known as the bishop. That is the congregation's spiritual leader. He preaches and performs baptisms, marriages, and ordinations. And we have the Dina zum Buch, the servant of the book, or we say the minister. He helps the bishop perform his duties. Most congregations have two of these ministers. And then there's the Amen Dina, the servant of the poor or the deacon who administers funds for the poor. The Amish hold services every two weeks in a different member's house rather than in a church. This emphasizes the importance of people over a mere building. Services consist of singing from the Ausbund, reading from the Bible, prayers, and a sermon. Every baptized male is then free to comment on the biblical correctness of the sermon. The in-between weeks are spent either visiting friends and family or in teaching children Hochdeutsch, that is high German, that's used in religious services. Before the semi-annual communion services, Members gather to settle any disagreements they may have that may have arisen within the congregation. For example, because the Amish don't milk their cows on Sunday, many milk truck drivers do not pick up Amish milk. Years ago, a fellow came into one Amish community and began promising the sun and the moon to the younger farmers. Sign up with me and we'll make money hand over fist producing cheese. The issue eventually split whole families as well as the congregation, with the older members disapproving 
of this cheese making scheme. And they moved to Penn's Valley. Many of the younger ones stayed and quickly lost their shirts in the venture. The Amish conduct their services in Hochdeutsch or standard high German. They generally discourage children from, oops, Their services in Hochdeutsch or standard high German. They generally discourage children from fraternizing with non-Amish or English children. The children usually don't learn English until they attend school. Formal education stops at the eighth grade. In 1972, the Supreme Court ruled in Wisconsin versus Yoder that the Amish had the right to limit their children's education. Another question English people often ask is, why don't the Amish like their pictures taken? Younger generations of Amish, though, appear to wave off that old prohibition. Even so, how and why did they adopt that belief? Many cultures around the world believe that you lose your soul when someone takes your photograph. We hear part of this in the second commandment about not making or worshiping graven images, about them literally taking one's soul. Look at it this way. If you receive your identity, your soul, from membership in a community of fellow believers, then taking a photo of your face expresses vanity and pride. It's cheap ego food. You've, you're elevating your individual self above, apart, and beyond the community. And by extension, you separate yourself from God. Some congregations permit their children, once they turn 16, to sample the world's temptation, a tradition known as Rumspring, or running around. Unfortunately, the media make a lot more of Rumspring than is accurate. Since they haven't yet been baptized, they're free to date, smoke, drink alcohol, and even wear clothing like ours. The point of this is to let them get it out of their system before committing themselves to the rule of the community. Only 10 to 15% decide to leave. The Amish shave off mustaches because they were traditionally associated with the military, but they grow beards to imitate the Hebraic dress code mentioned in scripture. Let me leave you with a few more stories. Some of them are rather disturbing because, but they give you a, a different perspective about this culture. Our one Amish neighbor's son stopped by for a brief visit. We happened to look out the window as he was going down the lane and notice his head moving above the corn stalks at a faster rate than if he was walking. The next day, we stopped by his parents' house and noticed someone had taken a sledgehammer to a bicycle. The mother came out and asked us, what do you think of people who ride bicycles? But the tone of her voice of that question was the same as if she had asked our opinion about what do you think about Jews? What do you think about blacks or any other ethnic or religious group? You've probably read or heard news reports of Amish puppy mills and other forms of animal cruelty. I've seen similar instances. One time, some neighbor kids were helping me hire haul firewood on their hay wagon. Two horses were supposed to be pulling the wagon, but one horse was deliberately lagging behind. These two kids jumped off and began, began punching and kicking the lazier horse trying to get him to pull his share of the load. The next day, we're going down the road on the wagon when this woman and her daughter stopped their car in the middle of the road, jumped out and began snapping pictures. The boys not only raised up one arm to shield their faces, they lifted their other hand to give these women the uh, <clears throat> royal salute, thus ruining their photographs. I certainly don't condone these behaviors, but I believe there are some things we can learn from the Amish 
and their collective experiences. Even though their religion forbids them from participating in political activities, many of the Lancaster Amish join local fire companies and help as part of their belief in being a good neighbor. And that I think is the crux of all of this, that too many of us have forgotten how to be a good neighbor. It's certainly a, tra a trait I find all too common among all people of German descent, Amish or non-Amish. Where else do you find people using the word neighbor, not just as a noun, but also as a verb? One other thing I hope you get from all of this today is in examining the role of change in our lives. The Amish are not against change per se. On the contrary, they constantly confront and analyze the perceived threats that change poses. And they ask in their own way, does change control us as humans ride on these silly social tidal waves and roller coasters, or do we, can we change, affect, control the changes that affect our lives? That is, do we let control, technology control us or do we control technology? In short, the Amish as a group constantly assess and reassess everything that touches their lives. Some follow the ideal more than others. Every group of human beings has its share of chuckleheads and idiots. My wife and I have seen a lot of changes among the local Amish over the past 45 years, especially among the Nebraska group. The ones who are my age or younger aren't letting their homes fall apart the way the previous old school hardcore generation did. More of them are using cell phones and wrapping their places in vinyl siding. And we're even seeing flowers in their yards other than behind the outhouse. The old order Mennonites I know in Union County have phones and computers, but these are only for business. While the Amish may seem eccentric, even exotic, they're not from another planet. And they're certainly not all the pious people of the land saying the and the thou like old school Quakers that the media and our schools lead us to believe. They are human beings exhibiting the simplicity, the complexity, the foibles, the follies, and the contradictions we all possess. Thank you.